Esports Connected. I'm your host, Megan Van Petten. Today, we have Rebecca DeGritis. Rebecca is the Director of Customer Engagement at Hargrove. She currently navigates the federal government event space, looking to incorporate exciting experiences for federal agents and their customers. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for joining. Oh, Megan, I am thrilled to be here. I'm so excited just to see you and to catch up. And, you know, I've I've always been a huge fan of Esports Trade Association, so I'm happy and honored to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. We are so happy to have you as a member. And um, I, I, I think it's safe to say you'll be serving on our events committee for our event September 14th and 15th. Yep, that's correct. Mm-hmm. We just came up with a theme, Beyond the Game. Oh, good. Oh, I like that. That brings in every, ooh. Yes. Oh, that's know. good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Love yes. it. <laughs> so we'll be setting up those um, meetings shortly. And thank you for all you've done and, and of course. you know, helping us at our past events. And so mm-hmm. tell us what you're up to. You're in D.C. That's right. Yeah, in D.C. So we're... um. I'm based in, uh, in D.C. is a pretty upcoming neighborhood called uh, or has been upcoming um, Navy Yard. So we're right here on the um, other side of the Potomac. So with where my current um, gig and this is coming uh, post COVID, you know, that's the disruption that happened there. My former employer was Freeman and now I'm currently at a um, fantastic firm called Hargrove. Uh, they're based in Washington, D.C. And really where um, esports comes in is that Hargrove is a mammoth event supplier here in the East and the DC space. Um, they've done inaugurations. They've done NATO summits, excuse me, NATO summits. They'd, we just finished the climate summit at the White House last week. So we're really n- niched into the federal government experience. Um, so I know people always are kind of saying federal agents, you know, what, what event space is that? What does that look like? And, you know, and there's so many exciting events happening in the federal government. And what what we've been interested to find out is that with this administration, as with every administration, right, there's such a turnover of um, individuals, postings, offices, bureaus. So as this new administration is kind of getting their feet wet and the transition teams are left, there's great excitement, you know, in this, federal government world. Um, particularly, you know, we've, we've seen there's an esport program that the State Department just launched. We're looking at other digital events and, you know, virtual events experiences that the government is looking at. But of course, you know, our greatest passion is for bringing things back, getting things back into in person and, and things like that. So long answer to your short question, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing here. And we got up and running in, in March and, it, and it's been a ball. It's a fantastic team. So very happy. I've always enjoyed talking to you, and one of the one of the things I um, I know is that there's no event too large or too small. I don't yeah. actually know many people that own the title. I do mega events. I mean, that <laughs> is just a statement in itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's where um, you know where my my prior work at, at Freeman was. Um, vice presidential debates and conventions and trade shows. And, you know, even before the space that we're seeing now, uh, the space is very noisy right now as people are reemerging. But for a lot of clients and customers, the differentiator between a mega event was not only capacity, but just the production and the logistics of the event. Um, I was also introduced to that my final phase of grad school, um, I was awarded to this student program to participate or, you know, study in the pre-production of the Tokyo Olympics. So that was a whole nother ballgame as far as just productions and, and logistics. And as a young person, I was very, very lucky to have gotten introduced to events at a big level. My first event was a National Retail Federation trade show at the Javits Center in New York, and that attendance was 34,000. So once you, you start at that level, there's no looking back. But with that being said, you know, no event. I've also done roundtables that I, I swear to you, Megan, I've done roundtable dinner receptions and ceremonies that have taken just as much um, blood, sweat and tears that mega events have 
have taken. So it really does depend on audience, client, and counsel, and you know what what their um, motivations are and what they're hoping to get out of it. And where esports came into that is that we were seeing so many gamification trends, especially around 2015, 2016. Everyone was talking about beacon technology. You'd walk past a booth and a trade show floor, all of a sudden you have a coupon from that booth in your email. You didn't even know how that happened. You know that was yeah. that was beacon. So that was the gamification. So what would be funny is that we'd be on site with the client and they want to. You know, if it was a, they want to do a pavilion to generate foot traffic, to make something, ex, you know, interesting and kind of sexy to get the people talking on a trade show floor. And they'd be like, well, you know, my son or my daughter, they're on, you know, they're on the Twitch and they play the video games. You know, there, there was always these, those conversations happening in 2015 and 16 about how to incorporate gaming into events. So that became my personal, um, my, excuse me, my professional kind of like, thought baby. And then I was lucky enough to get into a grad program. And then I was even more lucky enough to have a master's thesis in gaming. So it just, it's really come together well. And it's, it's exciting. Yeah. I'd like to hear, I know it was picked up um, by the um, International Federation uh, and you've just had an incredible um, amount of press around your thesis. Congratulations, yeah. first off. Well, you know, thank you. Making such an impact and um, sharing your work and your research. And, you know, um, as as one that I've also done my thesis, you know, presenting it and, you know, yes. graduating. So the whole thing is, is <laughs> such a project. Tell us a little bit yeah. about your thesis and, and how it came to fruition. And Yeah. So I think, um, so... For the end, Megan, you hit the nail on the head when you do the defense of the thesis. It's just that, oof, you know, you hear of those doctoral students defending their dissertation and they leave the room. And then if you, they know they pass, if they open the doors, they doctor and they come back in the room. Yeah. So my, mine was fairly similar where I was lucky enough to have some really great players in the esport arena in my jury that is this is a virtual zoom because I defended my thesis in May of 2020 so the last semester was a little bit of a crunch to the end as we all went virtual but um so I had some really great play um players actors in this space who were jurors and I had a great um advisor team so my director of faculty was like okay Rebecca thank you so much um we're gonna send you into a breakout room <laughs> I was like oh Oh, this is where they decide if I um, passed or not. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make fun. I'm going to, you know, keep fun of this. And so while I was in the breakout room, I ran and I got a t-shirt. Um, it was at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. So I went and I got my Hoya Saxa t-shirt. And so when I was brought back into the room, I was wearing my Georgetown t-shirt. I had changed. So they're already like, oh, so you, I'm like, I'm just going to go big, guys. <laughs> so about that defending process I understand but the, the thesis itself was fascinating so I think it took a uh, I was hoping to incorporate it with the Tokyo Olympics um, but because of field research um, that was no longer available I was supposed to head over there in March of 2020 yet plans changed so and with all good event planners we know that there's plan a b c d e f g so I went from plan a to plan b um, which was just focusing strictly on the gen z consumer for esport live event digitization and that was a fascinating aspect of seeing how the Gen Z consumer is so different from what we were anticipating them to be. Their preferences for a influencer or a specific esport athlete rather than, you know, a fan retention for an esport team, that's going to change how esports is presented to events. No, that's going to change how esport events is presented to audiences because if these are audiences who are really there for a person rather than a team, that's going to change the experience. That's going to change how you handle that. So there are a lot of really great um, aspects that came through that. So I was happy and, and very honored that the industry, the event industry and hospitality industry responded so well at a time that was so disruptive. You know, in yeah. 2020, there was a lot going on and I was just very um, humbled and very happy mm -hmm. that the thesis was able to get through to the people that it did, because I really do think that the idea of esports and gaming was exciting amid just what we're seeing in the disruption. So International Federation for IT and Travel um, got when and they, they published, then I was able to formally present the thesis at the conference in January. Um, and they're a very large conglomerate of hospitality academics. So that was a great opportunity for me to, to show up and be okay, guys, you know, I, um, I'm not a doctor by any means, and uh, <laughs> I'm really uh, an event planner who just 
is here and I'm so thrilled to be among you guys. You know, it was, it was a fantastic experience. And this, the data, the data was really fascinating as far as Gen Z consumers reacting to esports and gamification. Because what we see is that that can so easily translate to digital, virtual, hybrid, and live events you know, in the way of their preferences, how they spend their money, disposable income availability, what is their, you know, um, preferred platforms and things like that. It was, it's incredible. Yeah, it still is. <laughs> I know. Um, I just, and, and just to bring it back a little, you know, my favorite about planners that have their master's in hospitality, there's just something different. Um, it just, um, just the heart of the work when the yeah. heart, when when your heart is just poured in to mm-hmm. service. Mm-hmm. I always tell a story, and it happens to me at every event, and every time I'm on a flight or before the event at, at, with my team. There is a moment, whether the event is one day or three days or seven, mm-hmm. where you're walking through the event, where I'm walking through the event, and it happens. And it's just that magic yeah. that we did it again. Yeah. Every event I've ever done, I get the chills when I talk about it. I've done dozens and dozens and dozens over many, many, many years. Great. Yeah. And tears come to my eyes and I'm just like, okay. You know, yes. because yeah. it just takes so much. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it, it hooks you. And I think that it that's the, you. it hooks you. And I think it that's. Does. It hooks you in and it kind of, it, it feeds that fire of it's almost, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's almost not, not similar, almost like giving birth <laughs> where you forget the labor. Cause once you see the product of a beautiful baby product of a beautiful child that you're yes. like, Oh, this is incredible. You're like, I can't wait to, you know, have another one to do another one. And I think that's where, when I originally came to DC, I had, you know, studied in international affairs and politics. I had lived in China. I was specializing in Sino-American relations. And I was like, I'm going to work at a think tank and research. And then I remember, I shared this in another podcast. My first boss was like, we can't have you behind a lap. We can't have you behind a lap. It's a sin. You got to be out among the people. So I, I kind of fell into events in DC and it, it, it hooked me, completely hooked me to, to your point. Exactly. Yeah, and I would like to say furthermore that it's such an incredible honor to do an event. Mm, And the team, the team connection is another thing that's beyond words. Yes, absolutely. And I know that's where, I mean, I met John Davidson, right, through a very good friend of mine, Danny Hardman. And he, I originally met him. Long time, yeah, long time ago. I when I was his client, and then I ended up coming to work at his sim company. And then because the company was switching buildings, we ended up sharing office. And then because we shared an office, like you, you become work family in that way. So then you learn a streamlined approach of getting work done because you do know your coworkers so well. And you do have to you have a yeah. wide range of coworkers, you know, in events, it's very, especially esport events where you have so much technology to set up, you know, for AV, you have people who are traveling from rotational events from Vegas to Orlando, to Seattle, to Chicago, to DC, then to New York, you're just one stop on a 12 show tour that they're doing, you know, and these, and a lot of the AV men and women are so good at what they do, but they have very little time. So you have to be ready to be like, okay, this is what I need. This is what I need. One, boom, done. And then you have a client who might need a little bit more um, handholding, a little bit more massaging in the way of what you want the event to be. And that's a totally different communication style. And then you're probably on site approving signage and branding for another show that's moving in next week while you're producing this. Show. It's just, it's a whole nother world. But once you understand the language of it, and once you have the good people that are next to you kind of in the trenches, it just, it, it, you cannot not walk away. You know, you, you have to, you have to be there. You have to see it through. Absolutely. I, I mean, um, there's someone I've worked with at least 15 years who I've never done an event without mm. a physical event. Yeah. And he is such a calming force. We yep. call him Silver Fox oh, and you'll meet him in September. Okay. Um, 
We call him Silver Fox because when I met him, his hair was brown. (laughs) 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 But we always, well, in the day, um, you know, as of uh, two years ago, we Mm. we have these ear, you know, headsets in to talk to each other. Sure. And um, the the very last last, um, event we had, he, he was like, so there's no reason to concern and this is during a show, right? This is during a conference. He says, there, there's a leak in the room. Mm. There, so, so many, and he's talking, you know, to the whole team. Yeah. And he's calm as can be. And yeah. he says, um, so I'm going to need a bucket. Somebody can call me in. And he's mm. working the back time table. Yeah. And then he said, and, and there's some wires also. Exposed. Yeah. Exposed. <laughs> and yeah. he's still... Calm as a cat. Oh, right? Yeah. And then he says, I'm a small fire. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best that you have. See? And that's, we all have war stories like that. The first thing that popped up my mind is I was on, I was at an event in Pittsburgh, big event. We had the entire convention center. And we look and I see one sign and I see it was something like, you know, integrate innovation and exciting. You know, let's just say three tag words for a show look. And um, innovation was spelled wrong. I'm like, oh, that's just probably one sign. And then I look, I'm like, nope, no, oh, oh, okay. So the logo has a typo. So to reprint seven football fields worth of signs in about 24 hours. And it was like, okay, you know, and this is just how we do. And this is what we do it. And and I'm sure the people who will tell me, you know, I, and this is my approach to it. However, my colleagues or the people I work with, I'm sure like Rebecca is the energizer bunny and she goes, 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 which I do. But the point yeah. is that you still have to remain open to opinions, be calm when you need to be calm. Because I think that's where a lot of event planners tend to burn themselves out so quickly is that if you are doing a buffet and a Diet Coke and you have tons of Diet Coke or soda or pop, wherever you are in the country, whatever you call soda or pop, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're so focused on the fact that one of the Diet Cokes is a dent in it. You can't look up and see that a forklift hasn't been moved out of the ballroom yet from hanging a banner. Right. That's where you have to step back and look at the big picture. And that's yeah. where, especially for young people in the industry, that's where that tension of difficulty of the job comes from because you only, you don't know what you don't know. And until right. you find yourself in those experiences, you'll know how to prioritize. And then, and then even, even this week at a sales call, we had a competition like, okay, someone send your most in the weeds photo you know we're all sending photos of like there's a picture of my boss like vacuuming a stage at like you know a, a presidential debate because he and he's in the full full suit he just wants to get it just right you know and that's when you are able to kind of step back and be like oh here's the big picture but here's just a couple little things I want to fine-tune rather than the little fine-tuning things that escalate to a big picture it's it's an interesting way of approaching it for sure it is. I, I will never forget when I got into events and I had my first one and um, someone very wise to me said, put your seatbelt on. Yeah. Since you have no idea what you're getting into. Yeah. And it's going to be some of the most rewarding work of your life. And it has. It has. Yes. I, mean, I just have such great respect for event producers. And mm. one thing, you know, I would have to say about esports, what I love is the elevation of the experience and the yes. commitment to that. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And I think the elevation of the experience so comes from what was a subculture that now has become mainstream. And there's been such a firm wall of corporate discretion of who's allowed into that space. And when the corporate's certain corporations are allowed into that space and they do it well, they're more than welcome to come back and become partners. When corporations are allowed into the space and they maybe miss the mark on the first time, they're not invited back and that's okay. And I think that's where esports, the idea, the concept of esports as a platform, especially as, you know, event revenue, or if we want to get into, you know, more fiscally related topics, you know, that's where it gets it right. Because you elevate the experience in a way that we have never seen before in a way that maybe has always been there. But now with the um, technology explosion of 2020, we, we see it and experience it. So when you are so if you are, you know, Washington, D.C., I talk about the Washington Justice all the time. I know I, I prefer Overwatch as a gamer, but I also just really enjoy 
the team itself. And so if you're following Justice on Twitch, right, and then the Anthem or, you know, the studio or the arena opens up in D.C., you get to go to D.C. and watch alongside the people that you've been streaming alongside with throughout the whole pandemic. That's an elevation that would have been a marketing campaign about five years ago. But now it's organically happening because right. esports provides that platform. How cool is that? It's so I, beyond. It is. It is. And I think that's where, you know, we're, we're really excited to get into that space and provide those type of experiences to those consumers and introduce, you know, how people who wouldn't have considered gamification, you know, either too young, too sexy, too hip too expensive, to whatever, you know, or, or not enough, right? On the other side, like that's where we're excited to incorporate that to our clients and customers out there and just be like, take us along for the ride. You know, the world is waking up and we're waiting there with a cup of coffee saying, we missed you. Let's get on back to work, you know, that type of thing. So yeah, that's what we're yeah. shooting for. It, it, you know, it's always exciting for me to talk to, you know, an event executive like yourself. And, you know, such a proven um, event executive. Wait, tell me what you think about um, how virtual has been the last year. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly. I don't want to belabor, you know, the, um, the COVID right. topic, but I yeah. would love to hear, you know, your take on what, what the future looks like for us, how we're going to incorporate um, virtual yeah. and what you're sure. Well, and I think what's really interesting is that, you know, esports had already kind of set that standard as far as studio hybrid. So what we're going to see is a lot of permanent studio installations that would be broadcasting from a home network or excuse me, a home office you know, network, whether it could be a smaller convention that would have a studio broadcasting to the larger groups of people who otherwise would have traveled to that convention, but maybe not this year. And virtual provided, the virtual events that we were in last year provided that type of innovation. You know, it pushed people mm -hmm. to innovate at that level where esports had been, you know, we've had shoutcasters forever, you know what I mean? And so that it's pushed us to that level. Now, as far as the virtual event, you know, the good, the bad, and ugly of virtual event. We've all, we've all been wowed by some virtual events. I know I have some completely virtual um, trade shows I've been, I was, I was wowed at. And then there's also been some virtual events where you just want to, I just want to reach to the screen and be like, can I help you? Let me help you. Like, let me just, <laughs> let me, let me be the traffic controller behind the scenes, like pushing people into breakout rooms. so You don't have delays or things like that. Um, the finances is another conversation, right? I think um, there are, two camps and saying that virtual events are not financially sufficient in the way that you create the customer retention that's necessary to um, have the revenue. But then there's also virtual events out there that has a much more like social media platform where it's like, if you do an Instagram live or if you, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's very hard to compare for finances. It, it's totally relative on the company's situation or the firm's situation. But however, no, everyone can agree that the virtual experiences that we've had in 2020 have really led to some incredible innovation as far as creating, um, you know, customers and their expectations. You know, outside of 2020, their expectations and what it means to surprise and delight a customer has completely changed. And I feel like sometimes event producers because the work is so quick and so um, high standard and demanding to surprise and delight a customer, whether sometimes when it's in the plan, it will work out fine. But then sometimes we wait until there's a complaint to surprise and delight, right? So if the, the, the lines are so long at registration, maybe we um, get a couple of gift cards, walk up a dozen the lines, like, hey, thank you for waiting in line. Have a cup of coffee on us and give them a $5 Starbucks gift card. You know, that's a surprise and delight concept. And that's that master so. of hospitality. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that, that's the surprise and delight of a customer that, that could potentially have something negative to say about the event experience. So you're trying to change it. Now with virtual, that expectation of the customer, they don't even get to wait in line of registration anymore. They're already waiting for their $5 Starbucks card and they haven't even had a bad experience. You know, the expectations are so yeah. much different now. Yeah. And it's not a good or a bad thing at all. It's just, they're just different. And so mm -hmm. how do you meet them? Yeah, absolutely. I have a funny story. When I defended my master thesis, mm -hmm. 
I remember when they opened the door and they say, doctor. Yeah. When I remember when they opened the door, I said, master. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, you know, and, so, and, they, and they, wow. they chuckled. They were like, what? So, so what are you saying? And I was like, well, and I was joking, mm-hmm. but I was like, can I, so can I, um, go by Master Megan now, you know, like Master Megan <laughs> like, what the heck? Yeah. I mean, we go through all this work to get our yes. masters, and then, boom. Yes. So yes. I had to share that with you when you told yes. me your story about this. It, the defense is tough. I, you know, my, my thesis took me a year. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I think the defense is tough, and I think there was... um the hospitality, because there was at the time, hospitality, um, it's, it's leveling out now, but, you know, March, the last four months, March, April, May, there's such a disruption around it that, you know, my yeah. professional life was very difficult in handling that in combination with the academic life because I was um, full time at both. So I think when I came to May, I had the, the light, if you will, of using my professional disruption to really accelerate my academic data about digital events and esports because I we were physically seeing it happen right before our eyes. You know, we uh, two weeks. I mean, I can't I can't remember the days. You know, we all have our dramatic stories. I can't remember. It was something like a week or two weeks before we were supposed to go to Tokyo. You know, it, everything got called off. Like it just was very. You know, you had to be that that pivot. And then all of a sudden, you know, Georgetown's graduation was called off. And as masters, especially as professional master students, we're like, okay, like, you know, we got this, we move on. But then I was thinking about these doctoral students who were there like seven, eight, nine years of grants. I'm like, you want that moment for them to yeah. walk. So and that's where, you know, Georgetown did a really cool virtual event, you know, and and they did, they were able to incorporate you know, everyone in their own different pod about, you know, what the year has been. Then it's a Jesuit school. And so they had a, um, it was multi-religious. So they had a rabbi read Psalm 23. You know, it just, it was one of those moments of like, we got through (laughs) and it was needed at that moment. Right. But then what was so cool is that this adds to the expectations of the consumer. And I'll use my own virtual graduation party is that my, um, my family and my friend, like our, our, my people hosted a surprise virtual graduation party for me. So right after they read Psalm 23, all of a sudden I'm dropped into a Zoom happy hour and 30 faces pop on the screen. And my cousins from New York send a bottle of champagne using Drizzly. So all, like it was just like, bump, bump, you know, like that's exactly the type of experiences that people are looking for. Yeah. So it, it was a great, great moment. Definitely. Wow. What yeah. a great story. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Um, because we do, we want texture and color and yes. uh, beverage or food or mm-hmm. fitness or stretching. And yeah, um, wellness you know, is going to be huge. Wellness. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I really hope that we incorporate a lot of, um, of that in our, in our, we're, we're right now planning through our sessions yes. beyond the game. And I hope they cover. Yeah. I hope they choose some wellness. We did have some, we did have some think tanks already. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I've never sat so long. So I do now I have a stand desk. Oh, good. Oh you're, yeah. You're one step You're You're beyond. I need to get to that standing desk. Cause it's true. Like, yeah. Oh, there was, there was one time I, I remember I looked at my phone I was talking to my partner and I was like, well, I've done, you know, 63 steps. And he was like, 6,300. I'm like, nope, 63. I, I can see it right here. I've done 63 steps. Yeah. It's just like, this is a cry for help. You yeah. know, like I, we, we got to incorporate health and wellness into what we're doing here. Absolutely. Yes. So, so I'm hoping we can get um, a little bit more interactive I'm yeah. really looking forward to bringing everything we've learned the last year to our mm. September conference and so oh. excited to be part of it. Yeah. What else would you like to share? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot and ask why you joined. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about your experience and your membership with the Esports Trade Association and then if you yeah. have some parting advice for our community. Sure. So um, you know, I joined 
because when I met you and John, and John Davidson and I had crossed paths prior. John, I had on my own esport podcast, um, Shoutcaster Limited. He was the inaugural guest on there, and he was very. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yes, he yes. was my first guest. You have such good taste in people. <laughs> John Davidson is such a great guy. He is. And I was so flattered that he said yes. And so, and, and, you know, and, and, and he was, he, he used that time to talk about leadership. He used the time to talk about his routine. He used the time to talk about, you know, to the theme of September's event, he used the time to talk about beyond the game. And I think, you know, there's some clunks and some, you know, boo-boos on my end, because that was my first podcast and I was trying to get my head around it. But John Davidson and I met and then he, introduced me to ESTA, introduced me to yourself, MVP. And so as we were talking through it, I was like, this is a, just a good group of people. Because, you know, again, and I, I've, I've said it already, like the space is noisy. You know, it's a yes. noisy space. Everyone wants yes. a piece of the pie. So once you align with kindred business minds, it's such mm-hmm. a rare opportunity. And I felt like I had that with you and John. And then also with the people who I was meeting in the rooms, meeting in the breakout spaces, meeting in these sessions where we're all just kind of in the room saying what we're up to. Some people have the virtual background of the companies they are. Some people yeah. have the virtual backgrounds of the companies they want to work for, you know, and the way of, and the diversity of membership, you know, you have individuals who provide insurance to esports, and you have in, individuals who are specializing in the collegiate space. And then you have individuals who are gamers themselves and you have marketers. Like there's a very well-rounded base of kindred business minds I think is, is difficult to replicate and you guys got it. So I think that's something that I really encourage people to take advantage of, you know, if, if, and I think that's one thing I learned, um, I'll be completely honest, you know, April, March and April, I was furloughed for my job, you know, events with attendance over a hundred people weren't happening, let alone 25, 30, 100,000 events weren't happening. So I realized, I'm like, okay, my resume is going out. My connections are, you know, so I, I had to make my podcast my living resume. I had to flip that model to get my voice out there to be employed and, and to be hired, right? And when you're a lot, when you, and that, that idea of flipping the model was so often encouraged by the people I met in the esport world while I was researching for my thesis then accelerated by the people I continued to meet in ESTA. So the people who approach ESTA now who are interested or maybe not be aware, just be aware if you don't want to flip the model, if you don't, if you don't have questions and maybe you're not curious, still join because then the curiosity of the people who are in it are going to, is going to hook you. And they're going to, you know, encourage you to think outside the box. And if you are curious and you do flip the model, then we're your people. So it's very, it's a great organization. So I I really enjoy being a part of you guys. And, you know, even just having quick brainstorm that, that resulted in the level up challenge and, you know, things like that. Like, it's really, it's a good, good community. I remember I had a mentor tell me, wherever you go, you'll find your tribe. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to find your people. Yourself, right. Get, you know, right. And, 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 and your people will come and then your parting advice for the industry. Yeah. I think as long as you prioritize the experience, mm-hmm. you know, I understand and that that's it. Prioritize the experience, whether that's, you know, riot games is, is very player centered. So for riot games, you know, prioritize the experience for the players. If you're a marketer, prioritize the experience for the customers. If you are a self-owned business, prioritize the experience for yourself so you don't get burnt out. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's so much around the lines of, you know, 20, um, I guess, sorry, I keep referring to 2020, but we're, we're, we are emerging into a new business scope of how um, socioeconomic shifts of diversity and inclusion. All of a sudden, you know, companies are, are learning you know, where their gaps were in the past that left several large groups of individuals not incorporated, not feeling heard, not feeling prioritized to prioritize those experiences for them. So it, it's, it's, that's the simplest way, I think, just prioritizing the experience. You know, that, that's, that's it, right? Because that's, you want to keep people happy, not for the sake of, you know, the happy people spend money, but also happy people just provide good experiences. You know, it's, it's, it's a circular economy in that way. 
experiences are priceless. I mean, yeah. and you can't, you can't buy a beautiful experience. You really no, can't. Ma'am. You have no. to be the experience. Exactly. And, um, you know, I, I've enjoyed the last two events we've had that were um, virtual. And I am just itching to get together with everyone again. We have had um, member meetups here in Chicago um, with community. Oh, oh know, how lovely. Yeah, you know, before, yeah, before COVID. And um, just, I truly can't wait to get together with everyone and um, in September and have you join us. And yeah. you really, you know, make you make us better and one person at a time you know is oh, how you. we built our community and we're just so honored to have you and having you in service with our um events committee and everything you've already done and continue to do so thank you so much for joining me today and i also saw your parting word was flexibility oh yeah that flexibility, you know, prioritize the experience and flexibility. Let, let me add that on. I saw that. <laughs> you know, people do words of the day all the time. And I haven't heard flexibility lately. And, yeah. you know, after talking to you and even getting to know you more and getting connected to the show, I could totally just feel your commitment to flexibility. And it's so cool. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Because I think even with, I started, um, I've started this position at, at Hargrove and it's a brand new position and no one has had it before. So the flexibility of meeting the market of where it is, is a necessity and flat and meeting the meeting and creating the flexibility of where we can bring these experiences to our clients, whether we, we introduce ourselves through education cycle. So they, they know about us, you know, we, we are so into the political events in DC, the flexibility just remains so big in my brain, only just because with the procurement process and the government contracting process and codes and individuals, flexibility is necessary to get the job done. And I'll also just make sure that you, you keep a, a correct perspective. You know, how often do you miss? I you know I've missed things just because I went with my own opinion and, and opinions aren't facts. Right. Sure. And so as long as you keep open to flexibility, you, you keep open these awesome lessons and experiences that you can owe yourself, you know? So I, flexibility is key. And also just flexibility in the physical body. You got to keep those joints going. We've been sitting in chair. We've been sitting in chairs for 14 months. You know, like we got to do some yoga exactly as we both start adjusting. Like we got to make sure that we stretch. We do. <laughs> so get those steps in. Get those steps in. Yeah. It absolutely. is always a pleasure. And, um, Thank you so much for being a guest, Rebecca. Of Rebecca DeFritas. It's, it, it, yeah. it's an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Megan. Happy to be here. Thank you.